Good morning, good afternoon, uh, depending on your time zone, and welcome everyone to the uh, CAFC uh, Patient Safety Collaborative for um, April. And before we get started in today's um, actual uh, session that we're going to be doing, I'm just going to take a minute to let folks know about the upcoming Patient Safety Symposium that will be happening um, in association with the CAFC Annual uh, Conference. Um, which is taking place October the 20th to the 23rd. The theme is, uh, of the conference is Innovation in Children's Healthcare from Inspiration to Application. And for those of you who are familiar with the conference, um, the Sunday uh, prior to the actual start of the CAFC uh, annual meeting and conference is always a, an opportunity for us to take some time and focus on some patient safety in the terms of our two-hour patient safety symposium. So this year, uh, we, uh, we want to um, engage all of our CAFC uh, patient safety collaborative members in a little bit of brainstorming about uh, what would you like us to bring within um, the innovation in children's health care inspiration to application uh, framework uh, around patient safety. We know that experts in the field study and evaluate data to support new programs and tools. Frontline workers and clinicians employ various strategies to deal with those potential safety issues in all kinds of unique environments that serve children. Um, patients and families look at the healthcare system from different perspectives than we do and can also have a really significant impact on uh, patient safety in our, in our systems. So uh, families are, are really involved in, in caring and receiving care uh, throughout the whole spectrum of healthcare, and we're hoping that we can explore how families um, have shared their experience and knowledge and worked with us as uh, partners and part of the team to bring innovation to patient safety um, that serves both the system better and the patient and family center is better. So on May's call, which will be the fourth Friday in uh, May, as we meet every fourth Friday of every month, um, we would like people to bring their ideas to the call and to help us really shape a patient safety uh, symposium that meets the needs of what you're looking for within that framework uh, of what the theme is. Um, so it's going to be an, inf an informational meeting. It's a, a teleconferencing, uh, the same as what we're doing today, although we probably will not have a presentation with that. And um, it will uh, be able to allow us to best serve uh, what you think uh, you would like to hear at that symposium. So that's a little plug for what we're going to be doing in May and how we're looking to all of the expertise that we have across the country that join us the fourth Friday of every month um, to uh, best serve you in uh, when we meet in Toronto in October. So um, now we'll get to today's presentation. We are very fortunate today. Uh, to have a presentation on IPASS, a novel bundled handoff intervention. And we've got five speakers with us today that are going to be bringing this. And I'm not going to introduce all of them at the beginning. I'll just tell you who they are. And when they come online, they will uh, introduce themselves so you can be able to identify uh, which one is addressing the slides that are currently on your screen. Uh, so we're going to start off with Dr. K, uh, Dr. Trey Coffey, and she is from um, the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Uh, there, and she joined, joining her today is Zia Bismela, from, also from Sick Kids. We will have uh, Christopher Landrigan from the Children's Hospital in Boston, Dr. Amy Sturmer from Oregon Health and Science University, and Nancy Spector from St. Christopher's Hospital for Children. So I'm going to start off by introducing uh, Trey Coffey, um, and then she will um, in turn introduce the others and manage the slides from, from her point. So Trey's an academic hospitalist at SickKids, where she's recently assumed the role of the Medical Officer for Patient Safety. Associate Director of the University of Toronto Center for Patient Safety, and she's a member of the Pediatric International Patient Safety and Quality Community. And uh, if you, uh, those online, may recognize that this from emails that we get um, under the, the heading of PIPSQC. Her clinical and academic and administrative interests include disclosure of medical error, 
medication reconciliation, lean in healthcare, and handoffs. So I'm now going to turn uh, the presentation over to Trey. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Next slide to advance. So just to give everybody the background of how this webinar came to be, I had posted uh, my thoughts about IPASS on this blog on Pipsqueak that was mentioned. And Lisa picked up on it and um, invited us. And I just think it's a great testament to the kind of surveillance and connectivity that CAFC is offering. So an overview of what we'll try to cover in this webinar, uh, Chris will give us the background in terms of the research question. Amy will tell us um, an overview of the handoff bundle itself. I'll speak a little bit about implementation considerations and strategies. Nancy will talk about our tools and where they're available publicly in the dissemination efforts. And then Zia will close out with a medical student offshoot project as well as next steps for dissemination. Chris? OK, thanks, Trey. So, so like Trey, I am an academic hospitalist here in, um, in my case, in Boston, and have been studying patient safety for a number of years now. And in many respects, the, um, the genesis of discussions around handoffs began with um, a very closely intertwined discussion that's happening both in the U.S. and Canada and elsewhere in the world right now about, about resident work hours. Next slide. So um, just to very briefly discuss some of the literature on, on this topic that I think um, is important to understand going into this. There's, there's really 30 or 40 years of literature now that demonstrates that sleep deprivation adversely affects the performance of physicians, just as it affects the performance of folks in other occupations and in other settings. Um, in this meta-analysis that you're seeing on this, on this slide here by Ingrid Philibert, um, what she did is she took 60 of these studies that have been conducted over, over the past couple of decades and tried to put them together in as cohesive a fashion as was possible. Um, what you're looking at, just to orient you, is this is a fairly standard meta-analysis slide where the zero effect line is that thick vertical bar that's in the middle. And each individual study is represented by one of those um, dots that has horizontal 95% confidence interval bars around it. And this was sort of a complex analysis in that, in that all sorts of different outcomes were packaged together for this. So some of these studies were studies of residents' reaction times when they were sleep deprived, having been awake for 24 hours or more. Some of them were studies of their ability to read electrocardiograms. Some of them were reading uh, chest x-rays. Some of them were doing simulated surgery and very high fidelity uh, clinical tasks. Um, and what you're seeing is that you know, a few of these studies individually have 95% confidence intervals that cross that midline and would have come to the conclusion that sleep deprivation has no effect on the performance of physicians. But in the aggregate, I think it's pretty clear that, that the vast majority of these studies are to one side of that line, namely the left which is the side demonstrating that the sleep-deprived group did worse than their rested peers. And in fact, the magnitude of the performance decrement, that sort of dashed vertical line, across all these studies is pretty profound, where you're seeing a drop to about the 19th percentile of rested performance across all of these tasks. And if you specifically focus in on the more high-fidelity clinical tasks, like reading EKGs and so forth, the drop was almost a full standard, two standard deviations down to the seventh percentile of mean rested performance. So really, a, you know, I think a lot of science, a lot of, you know, a whole lot of studies demonstrating that there's an issue here is something that we, that we really do need to tackle. Next slide. But, um, you know, a criticism of this work up until about 10 years ago or so is that there was relatively little that had looked at the effects of sleep deprivation in the real world setting. So in other words, it's one thing to demonstrate that physicians who are sleep deprived um, have a hard time doing what they're supposed to be doing when they're, they're in a dark laboratory setting, sort of a quiet room where they're performing some standardized task. It's another thing entirely in the clinical environment where the adrenaline is pumping and there's lots of other things going on to say that sleep deprivation affects performance. And so what my group set about doing a number of years ago was to study this in a couple of different ways. And, and one of the things that we did, probably the, the most important with respect to the current discussion, was a randomized controlled trial where we looked at what would happen if we eliminated long long standardized shifts and instead put residents on a 16-hour work limit. And what you're seeing in this slide is that across a range of different types of things, both total medical errors as well as medication errors and diagnostic errors, those who are working the 24 to 30 hour shifts made many, many more mistakes than did those who are working shorter shifts. Next slide. And this, um, this finding, in fact, has been replicated by um, numerous investigators, although I, I think some of you may be aware of recent data looking at the effects of 
standard changes in the states and so forth that has not found it all to be um, a rosy experience. In those institutions that have really tried to implement this in earnest, and I think have put a little bit more um, effort than some into making sure that the infrastructure is well built and so forth, there are almost universally positive results of these types of efforts. Um, this is a systematic review looking at those types of, of efforts where individual institutions got rid of long shifts. And certainly with respect to resident quality of life and, and to a slightly lesser extent but still fairly convincingly with respect to patient safety and quality, things have gotten better when these kinds of changes have, have been made. With on the middle line there is resident education. Most studies showing that there's not an adverse effect of shortening hours on resident education, which is one of the real concerns of making this type of shift. Um, although the caveat to both this systematic review in general and this topic in general is that it's complicated and there is really a complex balancing of some of these factors that needs to be considered when these types of changes have been made, um, handoff being one of the most important. Next slide. So um, both here in the States, this body of literature really led to the Institute of Medicine and then the ACGME recommending some changes to resident work hours and closer to you folks um, in Canada at, at home there. Um, just in 2011, there was an arbitration you're probably aware of in Quebec where um, a resident with the support of the resident union there um, appealed, to, uh, appealed to McGill uh, University and its hospital there um, that, that the types of reductions, I mean, excuse me, the types of long work hours that he was being required to do as part of his residency um, was unsafe for him on the basis of, of data demonstrating increased motor vehicle risks and so forth as well as unsafe for his patients, and as a consequence said that this really violated um, his rights under the Canadian Charter of Rights and, rights and Freedom. And um, that ended up, um, after a sort of series of steps, going to uh, arbitration there at the, um, at the provincial level, and the arbitrator found in favor of the resident. And so as of July 2012, no residents in Canada are permitted to work um, shifts exceeding 16 hours, which um, in some respects is similar to what's happening here in the States, although um, the, 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 unlike in the U.S., the foundation for that law was the, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And so I think there has been um, real concern and interest in whether that uh, may end up extending ultimately to the rest of Canada, although whether that's going to happen or, or not is currently an ongoing question. Next slide. So certainly while there is considerable reason from a sleep and fatigue standpoint to think that that may be a good idea, um, the, the problem potentially with reducing shifts is that you do end up with an increased frequency of handoffs. Next slide. And um, although the literature on handoffs and patient safety is less robust than the literature demonstrating a relationship between sleep deprivation and patient safety problems, um, there certainly is, there are a number of studies out there that would suggest that when handoffs are happening more often, when residents know patients less well than, the, than, than their primary caregivers, the risk of both inefficiencies in care occurring as well as an increased risk of errors and adverse events uh, may increase. Next slide. But when we really delve down and look at the processes for handoffs that exist in most of our hospitals, there, there are fairly profound problems with that as well. Um, we know that from a, from a a whole series of studies that have been conducted in the past few years that um, while handoffs are extremely common across institutions, they are almost universally universally flawed. And part of the root of this appears to be that there's no, there's no standardized process for handoffs across institutions, and often there's not even a standardized process within an institution. Um, and indeed, training for, for handoffs is quite limited as well. Next slide. And Okay, so now we're going to show you a video, I think, that, that, that maybe exemplifies this, and hopefully this will um, feel familiar to those of you who are in these kinds of settings. Sorry I'm running late. It was such a busy clinic. I had like four school physicals. I hate all that paperwork. It always puts me behind. I know. Tell me about it. I had a clinic like that last week. Anyway, I'm not sure your night's going to get any better. We have a lot of really sick patients on the floor. Um, so here's your handoff sheet. All right, should we start with room one? Sure. Um, that's James. He's a 13-year-old with sickle cell disease. He's been here for about two days with leg pain. We think it's a vaso-occlusive crisis. He was admitted here last year or three months ago maybe with the same thing. His pain was very difficult to treat at that time. Yeah, I remember he was on a bunch of different narcotic medications. I don't really remember the exact regimen. Yeah, so we have him on a um, morphine PCA right now with no basal rate. I think his pain is well controlled, so you shouldn't have any issues with that overnight. In fact, we were actually thinking of transitioning him to PO pain meds, but he's on clears only now because of his respiratory status. 
my respiratory status. I thought he was here for a vaso-occlusive oh, crisis. Sorry, um, he actually um, has been tachypnic to the 30s and hypoxemic. He was on two liters nasal cannula O2 earlier in the day. We were able to wean him back to one liter, um, and he was actually off O2 for a little while when he went downstairs to get a chest x-ray because the nurse forgot to bring an extra O2 canister down oh to radiology. Gosh. I can't believe she did that. No, I'm, I'm not kidding, but he actually did okay. He is back on two liters now to maintain his sets, and um, I, I shouldn't forget, his chest x-ray did show a right lower lobe infiltrate, so you may need to repeat if his respiratory status worsens. So do you think he has acute chest? Yeah, I mean, he meets the criteria, although nowadays it really depends on which of our hematologists you ask. Right? Um, so let's see what else. Oh yeah, he, um, he spiked a fever to 39 today. We were called about his fever during noon conference, of course, but we got the blood culture when we got back. He was uh, a surprisingly difficult stick. Really? How many times did it take you? The nurse took three tries. I, I got it on my second try, though. Not bad. Well, thank you. Um, so, you know, we'll have to follow his culture, see if they grow anything. He's on ampicillin back to him right now. Dr. Smith says this covers the common respiratory pathogens. You know, if the culture comes back, you may need to switch him up, though. Okay, anything else? Um, let's see. Well, you know, the regular stuff. Watch his vital signs. He's getting pain scores. Watch the eyes and O's. He may have some electrolytes pending. Um, so I, I think that's it. The hematologist number is right there if you need to call him. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So now over to Amy. Over to Amy. Great. Well, I think I think probably everybody can um, uh, try to illustrate the scenarios in their own minds of um, handoffs that they've either been involved in or observed that are not meeting the ideal circumstances. Um, I'm Amy Starmer. I'm one of the, um, uh, I'm a, a general academic pediatrician at Oregon Health and Science University. I've had the great fortune to serve as the study lead for the um, ongoing IPAS study. And so I'm going to give you a brief um, introduction to kind of uh, the materials that we've developed for the IPAS uh, study that are now available for anybody who would be interested in using or adapting them for their own purpose in uh, their own institutions. So next slide. Um, when we were trying to think about how we could potentially address this complicated issue of pa a patient's handoff and how to improve it, it became clear pretty quickly that the issue that we were dealing with was really quite complicated and that if we wanted to have any significant impact on the, um, uh, or make a dent in the problem, that it wasn't going to be possible to just do, you know, one small uh, one-hour lecture and expect that that would probably have, have a su substantial uh, change. So we landed on um, uh, an interest in developing what we refer to as a resident handoff bundle uh, based on some of the prior work by Atul Gawande and uh, Peter Prognost and others who have um, uh, used the bundle methodology in other patient safety interventions. And we realized that we wanted to package a, um, several things together in order to try to improve this process of the handoff. And we did this first through a pilot study that was at a single institution at Children's Hospital Boston, where we studied the impact of um, the three elements that you see on the slide here, providing the residents with uh, communication training, um, uh, which included a team steps, uh, a, um, communication methods, and as well as an introduction to best practices for verbal and written handoff. We also uh, tried to standardize the verbal handoff by implementing a verbal mnemonic, and we worked with the IT leadership of the hospital to develop and implement a computerized handoff tool that was integrated within the electronic medical record. And at this single institution in Boston, we studied the effect of all three of, of these components, um, putting them in place on several outcome measures, including medical error rates. Uh, we looked at um, uh, rates of verbal and written miscommunication, and also looked at uh, resident physician workflow patterns. And uh, the initial um, data from this study was actually quite promising in that we had reductions in medical error rates and reductions in rates of miscommunication. However, we were still somewhat limited um, in the fact that this was, had only occurred at a single institution, and um, the study design uh, um, had some limitations to it that we couldn't be entirely sure that the changes that we were seeing uh, weren't due in part also to some other other factors such as other ongoing patient safety interventions or residents uh, learning over time. And so we um, and we also had some concerns about um, the sustainability of the intervention. We realized that um, after the study was over, we were having uh, noticing that the residents were kind of reverting to their old ways and 
uh, uh, handoffs still had significant room for improvement. So uh, next slide. So with the um, preliminary success of the pilot study, um, that's what really led us into uh, our current work with the ongoing IPASS study, which um, uh, this study back, uh, started back in 2010 when 10 different pediatric residency programs across the US and Canada um, embarked upon a, um, this study, which had an, an aim at um, improving handoffs of care. Um, the aim of our study was really um, quite similar to the pilot study in that we wanted to assess the impact of uh, um, uh, improved uh, and uh, augmented resident handoff bundle on very similar outcome measures of medical error rates and rates of verbal and written miscommunications as well as workflow patterns and satisfaction. Next slide. Um, and we went through quite a rigorous process to um, uh, reflect on what had worked and um, hadn't worked as well in the pilot study for um, what components of the bundle were most effective and which um, might benefit from further adaptation. And we went through a very rigorous process of curricular design uh, with a group of uh, leading medical education experts um, uh, from representing all the different sites participating in the project. And what we landed on at the end of that process was a handoff bundle that was um, much more um, robust and um, uh, complex than I think any of us had really anticipated was going to um, occur. You can see the main components of the handoff bundle that um, is being studied um, in the ongoing study now and that is all these components are now available um, from, from our project uh, website. But really the, the handoff curriculum itself now is um, centered on a new novel mnemonic, IPASS, which I'll give an overview in just a second. But the uh, components also include um, a core resident workshop, which is a two-hour didactic session where the residents have the opportunity to participate in a um, series of interactive uh, exercises. There's a um, module that's been developed to enhance faculty development, um, knowing that we need to be training our faculty in these principles of best practices for handoffs as well. Um, all of the participating sites have um, worked to modify their um, printed handoff document in a format that mirrors the mnemonic being used uh, for the verbal handoff process to um, emphasize that, re-emphasize um, that standardization uh, step. Um, the residents did receive training in team steps, um, and we've developed a series of simulation expert uh, exercises um, uh, that are able, that is a, um, a one-hour experience where residents have the opportunity to give, um, receive, and um, practice observing uh, handoffs and, um, and then get feedback from faculty and other observers. Um, and really, evaluation and feedback has been a key component of this intervention as we've um, rolled it out across the different sites. Uh, we've had a very um, uh, invested group of faculty that has uh, uh, dedicated time to actually uh, doing real-time live observations of the handoffs um, in, uh, on the resident wards and giving the residents feedback, which we think really is a key critical part of uh, sustaining this effort. And then along, um, along those lines of sustainment, um, we ha part of one of the really novel things about the uh, revised bundle is that we have a group called the um, IPAS Campaign Committee, which was a group that um, spent a lot of time thinking just how can we uh, really get this uh, process on the minds of the everyday uh, residents and clinicians and um, uh, trying to do things like develop a logo and brand the um, study as well as um, kind of more uh, um, uh, everyday things such as uh, developing tips of the day or uh, refresher modules that could be used in order to uh, reinforce these concepts. Next slide. Um, I mentioned team steps al already. We felt that um, this is a program developed by the Department of Defense and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Um, it's an evidence-based team training curriculum um, with, that is centered around the idea that there are um, specific um, characteristics of high-performing teams that um, are important to be aware of. We felt strongly that it was important to address issues of uh, team communication and best practices for um, communication as uh, we, as this is an integral part of the handoff process um, uh, as well. Next slide. And then I mentioned that the curriculum itself really is centered around the IPASS mnemonic. 
mnemonic, which you can see um, here on the screen, and I'll go through each individual element of the mnemonic um, briefly. Um, but we felt that it was important to standardize the curriculum um, uh, in some way. If there is some evidence to suggest that standardization can be helpful and lead to reductions in medical error rates. Um, we went through quite a long process to try to think through what the ideal mnemonic might be. Um, uh, following a literature review, it became clear that there wasn't any real research to suggest that any of the um, numerous mnemonics um, that are already out there would be any better than any others. Um, but we really wanted to have a mnemonic that um, would kind of um, go reinforce the key um, um, principles that are most often uh, left out of the handoff process, but um, that again would um, uh, reinforce these um, elements in a, a very simple and easy to remember format. Next slide. So with the mnemonic, um, the first letter of the mnemonic is um, I, which stands for illness severity. Um, uh, this, we have trained the residents and uh, providers in this study to uh, use the classification of um, uh, a three-point classification system of either stable watcher, um, which a watcher patient would be somebody that you just kind of have a gut feeling is um, something might be developing or um, on the horizon for potentially um, becoming less stable and then unstable. And we felt like it's really important to start off the handoff process with this classification to um, focus the attention appropriately and again to use a standard language for this process so that um, people would know what to expect and everybody could be on the same page. Next page. The P stands for patient summary. And this is something we spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, it's a really complicated skill to try to teach. Uh, how do you really um, teach somebody to synthesize in a very succinct way um, all of the um, issues that are going on with a particular patient. So you can see here are some of the things that we um, highlighted in the curriculum regarding the patient summary. We provided um, an overview of what we believe the main components of a patient summary would be and emphasized some um, techniques and strategies to um, uh, improve that, that synthesis. Next slide. The A stands for action list. So this is kind of the traditional uh, to-do list. Uh, we discuss with the residents a lot of the importance of um, um, that all to-do lists are not created equal and that it's important um, that the elements in a to-do list have a ident clearly identified timeline, um, a clear level of priority, and who's going to be responsible for completing that task and whether or not it has been completed. Um, we emphasize a lot um, in the curriculum uh, that these um, you know, lists and the sign outs generally need to be kept up to date. Um, and then it's important to let you, the receiving uh, team or provider know that um, uh, whether or not that you've already thought through this process. So if um, there are no action items to specify nothing to do. Next slide. Uh, the first S stands for Situation Awareness and Contingency Planning. This was a key uh, component that we wanted to include. And really, it's the idea that um, uh, it's important to have situation awareness or to know what's going on around you and your patients, um, and then to be able to do contingency planning or planning for things that might go wrong. Um, and by um, having a plan in place for things that, may, that you anticipate might um, uh, go wrong or be uh, worried about. This ensures that the accepting team and providers will be prepared to anticipate and then respond to those changes um, and uh, leads to the development of a shared mental model. This was something that was also quite challenging to uh, figure out how to um, uh, teach, ideally, um, uh, the um, uh, we had to think a lot about um, how we could give the, uh, the residents and trainees specific guidance along the lines of um, what might uh, be a good way to articulate this and how to define their strategies. Um, and again, identifying for uh, people that you don't anticipate anything will go wrong to make that clear to let the receiving providers know that you've already thought that process through. Next slide. The final S of the mnemonic stands for synthesis by receiver. This is a um, the idea of, um, uh, again, a, a kind of uh, team communication strategy of the importance of closed loop communication um, and something that we felt was important to end the handoff process with a brief uh, 
statement of the key information um, summarized in a way that the um, both providers uh, know that a shared mental model has been achieved and that um, both parties are um, comfortable that people are on board with what needs to happen for that patient um, and to engage both parties in the handoff process. Next slide. And so now I think, Trey, you're going to talk about a little bit about how we um, work to implement some of these uh, aspects of the bundle. OK, can everyone hear me? OK, so I'm going to talk about um, implementation. And um, I'm going to um, speak to our implementation here at SickKids and also a little bit about what I've learned speaking with um, folks at other sites. So we feel like. Um, one of the critical first steps in implementation is building a critical mass of believers. So this is definitely um, something that is a, a fairly major effort, and you definitely don't want to go it alone. Um, at my site, I know the, the part of the residency program director was critical, and she sort of had a problem on her hands in that the residents were complaining to her about the quality of handoffs, and that really helped get this going. Um, because our focus is on inpatients, uh, you may want to have the support of an inpatient medical director. If you're implementing in an academic health sciences center, then the chief residents are really key. Having the support of a safety officer, safety director, um, and even the level of a, of a chief executive. Because um, as Amy mentioned, one of the major parts of the intervention involves IT uh, interference. It's important to have pretty high level clearance, uh, I think, before proceeding. And then you want to have a variety of what we call champions um, who are willing to help with implementation, uh, curriculum delivery, and campaign. And we can't emphasize enough how key these um, champions are to the implementation success. So in terms of the levels of involvement that a, a champion might have, um, they may partner with you to deliver the core workshop. They may come towards the end of the workshop to facilitate a small group simulation of handoff. Um, as Amy mentioned, one of the most key things is people who are willing to go and observe real handoffs live and give real time feedback. Um, and then the campaign, so all the materials that kind of show everybody that we're doing this and this is important. So communication is really important, and as we speak with people, who have come through the many stages of this and who are maybe a year in, people continue to dwell on how it's communicated. So you know, we give folks a really strong basic foundation with this multimodal delivery, including didactic simulations and videos. Um, but the reinforcement phase is really, really important. And you know, we thought maybe six months, maybe 12 months, but given the turnover of, the, of this sort of the academic cycle and the fact that we're um, reaching some of our trainees in their late stages of training, we sort of are looking at a multi-year time horizon where it may be when the people who learned it when they came in have become the senior residents that it truly takes hold. So you know, reinforcing it with um, some of the materials we've talked about, but also having open discussions with people about what's working and not working. We've noticed that you know, residents tend to um, want to feel that they are shaping and controlling how something is implemented. And we are providing a lot of tools that are ready for use. And so it's a really fine art to balance using a, a ready-to-go tool with allowing them to feel that any modifications are going to be made so that it works for them. This is just a sampler of some of the visual aids. Uh, my personal favorite at our site has been the laminated badge tag. Um, so this is a, a, a sample of this um, mnemonic so that people are carrying it around on their lanyard and can refer to it over the course of the year. And then this is just a sample. We mentioned the observation and feedback. And this is a validated tool that's also available on the website for, uh, for example, faculty who are on service can observe residents doing handover and use this to um, help them give feedback. And now I'm going to hand over to Nancy. Thanks, Trey. Um, I'm Nancy Spector. I'm at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in Philadelphia. I'm a general academic pediatrician, a residency program director, and an associate chair for faculty development. I've had the privilege of, of co-leading the Education Executive Committee with Amy on this work, and also co-chairing the um, Dissemination Committee for the, the group. Um, and I wanted to just reinforce what Amy said, that the, the uh, curricular materials and, and all the other materials that we have have been the culmination of about two years of work um, 
from people from all the 10 institutions. And that has been a combination of work from educators as well as hospitalists. And it, it's really been a great collaboration working, uh, working together. Um, next slide, please. When we developed all the materials, obviously we needed them for use in our study, but we really wanted to make them widely available. So prior to our, um, after we felt like we were ready to uh, disseminate, um, we actually created a website for ourselves, and the, uh, the link is above, um, so that we could freely um, distribute all the materials. We also, at the same time for academic credit purposes and also to further dissemination, we decided to submit all of our materials for uh, peer review through MedEd Portal, which is through the Association of American Medical Colleges. And I'm pleased to say that four of the six modules that we have um, available for IPASS are now available on the MedEd Portal website, but all of the materials are actually available on our IPASS website. Next slide, please. If you're interested in obtaining the materials, they're quite easy to access. You can go to our website and request the materials. We just ask for a few pieces of information from you because we're trying to track how things are being disseminated. Same experience for MedEd Portal. They ask you a few uh, questions um, to log on to be able to receive the materials. So on our website, as well as through MedEd Portal, we have all the materials related to uh, how to deliver the curriculum, all the evaluation tools, all of the pieces of the um, campaign as well. Next slide, please. And we, we've been really excited by the dissemination to date. We launched our uh, website in May of 2012. Um, we've presented um, our, our materials in many different national workshops in the United States. Um, and we have uh, now disseminated to all but four of the United States and to 12 countries, including Canada. So we're excited about that. Uh, next slide, please. We have been tracking who has been requesting our materials. Um, and by far, physicians are the uh, largest number of people uh, um, asking for materials. But nurses actually are very interested, as well as many other provider types, including pharmacists and physical therapists and all kinds of other providers as well. Um, by far, um, pediatrics as a specialty has been the most um, requested group. Um, however, surgery is second. Um, and here in the United States, there is now a requirement through the ACGME that institutions um, monitor the teaching and, um, mo and observation of handoffs. So we've had increased interest um, from many other specialties because that's across all specialties. So we've had a, quite a wide variety of people requesting materials who have been very interested in adapting what we have. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm Zia Vitella. I'm one of the site investigators here at SitKids along with Trey, and I'm also one of the site investigators for one of the next steps for uh, the IPASS study, which is one of the offshoot studies, um, which is spreading IPASS to medical students. So six of the IPASS study sites have embarked on a sub-study, uh, and the reason we're doing this is because we did a little needs assessment looking at who's involved in handoffs at the various sites. Four of the six sites actually had 30-year students involved in handoffs, and all of the sites had fourth-year students involved in handoffs. We found that the training of the various medical students, uh, regardless of level, was very different. And however, despite that, one of the site list, sites listed handoff as a graduation competency, and one site listed it actually as a core course objective. But the bottom line was that regardless of whether or not it was objective or not, there was a notable deficiency in handoff training. So why actually teach medical students to, to be uh, better at giving handoff? Well, it does prepare the students for their residency. As you know, teaching any, anyone anything earlier promotes earlier mastery of, of the skill, and handoff is no different. And also it improves patient safety by reducing potential miscommunication during handoff for the, the least experienced of, and the most vulnerable of learners, the medical students. What we've done for the medical student study is to actually look at the materials that were produced for the resident study and modify them, make them more appropriate for the learner at, at the medical student level. So the core elements remain the same. It's the same bundle with team steps training, the written document, and the uh, standardized verbal mnemonic. 
Um, but we've simplified the simulations a little bit, um, made the medic medicine a little bit easier. And we've also shortened the overall um, sort of presentation to make it a little bit more manageable to fit into the existing medical student curricula. Um, so the ancillary study, as we mentioned, is developing at six of the sites, and the pilot is beginning this June. What the actual objective of the study is, is to compare whether or not 90 minutes of in-person training, which is what we did for the resident workshop, is equivalent to the, an online module. And the online module was used sort of as a backup training method for the resident study for residents who may not have been able to participate in the full workshop. And the medical student study will hopefully be able to determine whether both methods are equal in terms of hand-on knowledge and also at decreasing communication errors. And once the study is complete, the curriculum will be made available uh, just as the resident curriculum has been made available. So as far as next steps and dissemination in Canada, when um, Nancy showed us that, that nice world map with the red pins, we really want to start spread it, spreading those red pins up north even more than they already have been. Um, and Handoff is actually an Accreditation Canada leading practice. Um, it's accreditation, accreditation Canada has said that um, commendable, Accreditation Canada leading practices are commendable examples of high quality leadership and service delivery that could be implemented within other organizations. And IPAS has actually been named as one of those leading practices. Um, this fall, we're going to be presenting a workshop at ICRE, the Royal College Education Conference in Canada. We'll also be pre presenting a seminar at the Child Neurology Society meeting. And I think we've, we've seen lots of opportunities for where dissemination in Canada is just ripe right now. The Canadian Association of Interns and Residents um, did a presentation not, not long ago, and they're actually looking to produce their own handoff training. And so there's an opportunity there for um, to collaborate with them. And also the CMPA has on their website best tips for handoff and are actually offering a grant to look at um, various ways to implement improved training for communication. So the environment right now in Canada is really ripe for dissemination of this sort of thing. And of course yourselves would be someone that we would also look um, at partnering with to further move, our, move handoff into um, the mainstream. Okay, I think we're, um, we're open to taking questions at this point. Maybe I'll jump in at this point. It's uh, Tracy Ron, I'm one of the co-chairs. Thank you so much, uh, very much everybody for all of your contributions to today's presentation. Um, I know that Lisa will be uh, happy to um, uh, manage the questions as they might come in. So, um, Lisa, are you there that you want to just put a word in on how to do that? I believe I'm here, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> just having a few technical difficulties at this end. Um, yes, if people want to write their questions or comments into the question uh, pane that's in the control panel on the right-hand side of their screen, I don't have any questions at this point yet, um, but uh, in listening to the, uh, I have some hands up, so maybe I'll see if uh, those people want to participate in a live chat. So I will, uh, uh, Krista Kilty, I see your hand, no, it's not up anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you have anything that you wanted to say? No? And, okay. Uh, people are asking, will, will the slides be available? And um, the uh, recorded presentation will be posted on the Knowledge Exchange Network. And um, Trey, would uh, your team be able to forward me the just the slides as well, just so that we can uh, um, yeah, sure. post those as well? Okay, and I have from Bob, it says, great presentation and excellent work. Can you give an idea of what the IT requirement is? This is often an issue for our institution. That's a great question. I think um, among our 10 sites, we had a little bit of everything. We had folks who were on some of the big vendors, uh, some of the small vendors, and folks that were, did not have any electronic health record or CPOE. Um, so I think uh, you know, the basic format of the IPASS handoff written document can be created in any in any setting, regardless of what the IT infrastructure is. 
um, I, for us, you know, we use one of the large vendors, and it was a matter of going to our um, chief medical information officer and kind of pitching the idea. And fortunately, handoff had been raised as a problem in so many other fora, M and M committee, safety reporting, etc. He was was keen to help with handoff, and so it was a matter of deploying a um, one of the IT professionals to partner with us so that we could tell them how we wanted it to look. They did some programming behind the scenes and came up with a prototype. And for our side, I think we probably did four rounds of kind of beta testing and refining. And I think that that's probably similar across the site. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Darlene, did you have a question? Hi, I do. Um, I'm just wondering, I thank you all for the, the presentation. I think it was um, great and certainly uh, gives us lots of food for thought, and including, um, you know, uh, inspiration to application thought. Um, anyway, I'm just wondering if you um, drew on any of the elements of other programs that were aimed at, at maybe team training and handoff, and I know in the patient safety movement, we had spent a lot of um, energy a few years back on uh, developing better SBAR communication, not for maybe general handoffs, but for critical situations. I know the more OB program has uh, components of handoff in it. So I'm wondering if yours is totally novel, and I haven't uh, gone back and looked into uh, your slides per se, uh, but whether it's totally novel or whether you've um, uh, capitalized and expanded some of the other efforts that were out there in the patient safety movement. Yeah, I think, Amy, would you want to take this question? Sure, yeah, I think um, we did try to balance as we were um, uh, going through this process. Um, we did a, a good amount of um, review of the literature and trying to um, build on what was already um, available. Um, <clears throat> we also conducted a needs assessment of all of the sites that were participating to make sure that we were building on resources that were already available within our own institutions that people might be aware of and trying to um, take advantage of that. But um, we did also kind of um, take several steps back and reflect on what might be most effective um, uh, using the consensus of those uh, experts within our group. So it was kind of a, a balanced approach, I would say. Nancy might also have something to add to that. Yeah, no, no I, I totally agree, Amy. And, and then uh, we did have a member of Team Steps as part of our, our working group at the beginning. OK, we have a few questions coming in here in comments. So uh, it says, regarding the sign-over list, to what extent is the work on the sign-over distributed in the typical resident workday? Do all data elements have to be generated or recalled at the time of sign-over, end of day? Uh, is the workflow integrated with electronic note-taking? So this is the, uh, I can answer that question. So the handoff document at our site, at each site I think it, it might be slightly different, but at our site parts of it are auto-populated. So the medications and, and the patient demographics are auto-populated. The residents do need to enter the patient summary themselves and keep that updated each day, as well as the to-do list the situation, and the situation contingency part. Um, but our residents actually print off the handoff document and walk around with it um, the same way that I think is typically done at many, many sites, and uh, check off the items on the to-do to list as, as they work through their day. Um, we have about, I would say, about 15 to 20 patients on each of our teams, and so a typical handoff document has about 15 to 20 patients on it, and the residents will just divide up the patients, but, but still carry the list with all of the patients on it and all of the to-do items on it. And I'm not sure if um, Chris, Nancy, or Amy, if it's any different at any of your sites. Um, well, I would, I would say it's a fairly similar process across sites. I think you're right that exactly how the workflow plays out depends a little bit on the nature of the electronic medical record system and what the constraints of particular institutions are with respect to resident note writing and so forth. But basically the flow you describe I think is pretty accurate. Okay, and from Marga, you have, uh, this is an excellent presentation. I see that the focus is for physicians and I'm very interested for nursing. Can this format be applied for nursing handoffs? Amy, I think uh, nurses are using iPass at your site. Would you like to comment on that? Sure. <clears throat> I think both myself and Chris could probably comment to this. Um, Chris and I have done some work um, over the past couple years to actually already work to 
adapt these resources for nurses and to um, uh, do some similar kind of single institution studies uh, looking at the impact of uh, deployment of uh, IPASS for nurses um, at both uh, Children's Hospital Boston and now at Oregon Health and Science University. And we found that the format is actually readily available and adaptable for nursing use. The elements of the mnemonic um, really are quite universal. We found that the uh, nurses and really other provider types as well who have shown an interest in using this particular format or uh, resources or the mnemonic um, tend to uh, have different things. For example, in the patient summary, uh, there are different elements that they feel are critical that should be transmitted, but that the other elements are really um, fairly constant, and um, it's been quite successful. Uh, Chris, do you have any other comments to add? Yeah, I, I agree with that and um, would say that we've had the experience here that although we initially implemented the program for residents to residents sign out at, at change of shift, it has it has morphed into something um, more than that, where a number of our different specialty services have seen, for example, the computerized tool that was being developed and asked for adaptations for their use, which our IT department has been very accommodating to. And, and likewise, as Amy had said, um, both nurses as well as other groups of specialty have tried to take on the larger program in earnest as well. And at this point, our nurses now use IPASS for all admissions for patients from the emergency department up to the floors, for floor to floor, for handoffs, for operating room to ICU transfers, you know, pretty much pretty much everywhere, at least in the medical services right now. It's gradually spreading from there. Excellent. So actually, I have a, a comment here. Uh, as a, as a FYI, that the IWK, they're trialing a nurse internal transfer tool within the Children's Health Program, and they included resident and nurse-focused literature uh, in the review of the practices. That's great. I think we'll be reaching out to them soon in our um, attempt to sort of spread this across the country. Darlene, did you have any more comments about that? I do. I'm curious. I know you, that you uh, said that um, at the beginning that um, when you went back and, and re-looked, it had dropped off. I wonder if you have any plans for maybe another uh, sub-study about how this sticks into actual practice when they're out of residency. That sounds like a wonderful idea. We, we, are, we are doing an ancillary qualitative study going around to each site and interviewing residents and other stakeholders about what are the critical barriers and success factors to sustainability, um, but we hadn't thought about looking at how um, they're using it or not using it after they're out in practice, I and mean, that's a really interesting idea. Okay. So I don't have any more questions or comments coming in at the moment. I don't know if, um, uh, if anybody out there has anything else to add. Um, I see that um, we uh, at CAFC, we have um, a, a sort of a, a partnership um, and a relationship with the Pediatric Chairs of Canada, and it would have been uh, it would be uh, maybe an opportunity sometime to to uh, present it to those chairs to present the IPASS. And have you presented it to the like the program directors across uh, Canada? Uh, not as of yet, but we are. I I am meeting with the Canadian Pediatric Program Directors just before CPS in June for another study, so I actually do have a forum with them where I, I could I could discuss IPASS as well um, if, if the sort of leaders, uh, Chris and Amy and the Coordinating Council is on board with that. Excellent. Um, and just uh, so that everybody knows, I'm just going to show everybody where the recording will be. So for everybody's information, uh, all of our CAFC presentations are presented, uh, are uh, posted to our Knowledge Exchange Network. You can get to it from our website, uh, cafc.org, and then you'll find a link to the Knowledge Exchange Network where you'll find all of our, um, all of our presentations posted. And it'll be under the patient safety, uh, under the patient safety uh, category. So here we have some of the information and links to the IPASS uh, website, and then we'll post the presentation there. And somebody's just wondering if the modified nursing forms might be available to view. Uh, Chris, do you, are you aware of that? 
Yeah, so um, if, if whoever is interested in that, if you want to just send me an email, what I could do is put you in touch with the nursing folks here um, who, have, who have developed those forms and, and, and see if they're able to share those at this point. If, uh, my, my email address is clandrigan at partners.org. All right, so I'll, um, I can perhaps connect the two of you uh, informally offline as well. Sure, that's great. And uh, so Evan says, we use a similar process in Calgary, an electronic sign-over tool, SCM All Scripts with mnemonics SBAR. Uh, a challenge, this workflow represents extra work, which will always require extra time and energy. We need to find ways to have this scale across our existing workflows. Absolutely. Lisa, it's Darlene again. I have a question for uh, Zia and Trey. Mm -hmm. um, a, few, a few years back, and I suspect you're still using it, um, uh, we looked at the transfer form that Sick Kids was using for admission from eMERGE up into their wards and the process for that. So is that still in place and this is this would be layered on for any kind of handoff and not necessarily admission transfers, or is this replacing some of that as well? Uh, so that, that form does still exist, and I believe it's, it's uniquely used for nursing handoff from transfers from uh, eMERGE up to the floor, whereas the, the IPASS handoff document is specifically used for inpatients for the residents to hand off um, sort of care of the inpatients to each other during the day. So it's not used currently, at least, for transfers between um, between the eMERGE and ourselves yet. But interestingly, the, the, the nursing staff has expressed an interest in sort of integrating the documents um, because they found that they have their, their documents that they're using and we have ours. And a lot of the information um, on one may not be on the other. And, and each of, obviously, the different people can benefit from the different information. So we are thinking about sort of down the road maybe integrating all of the documents and having having one sort of master document. Excellent. Okay, so it looks like we're getting to the top of our hour. I don't know, if, Tracy, if you had any final comments? No, well, I just, on behalf of CAFC, I, I just would like to extend our, our warmest thanks to all of the participants, uh, our presenters in particular, on today's call. A really exciting tools that you've got and you're developing and you're deploying and that's um, really interesting to see and of course it does speak to the patient safety uh, um, uh, theme that sort of runs close to the core of this particular collaborative and uh, we'll be really interested in supporting you and, um, and following the progression uh, as you manage to spread certainly throughout the, the Canadian pediatric uh, community. And uh, I I would certainly encourage you to connect via Lisa through to the pediatric chairs because I think that that really is a great forum and uh, and would really allow you to gain some more traction, I think, because CAPSI and, and the pediatric chairs uh, definitely have that linkage. So um, on behalf of CAPSI, thank you to the presenters and to everyone for participating and reminding uh, our participants that the uh, next call is Friday, May 24th at 11. And uh, we look forward to um, having you on that call then, too. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you.